so um, today's lecture, we're going to build on some of the reminders from last time, uh, but extend them quite a bit further when it comes to understanding uh, dynamical systems and, and characterizing dynamical systems from these four perspectives that I articulated last time in which whose names are written on the board. So these two structural depictions, depictions as stock and flow models and as in terms of the, the underlying state equations as we characterize them, um, uh, the detailed characterization that sort of collapsed down to as concise a method uh, uh, means as possible. In this case, we're talking about systems of ODEs, okay, ordinary differential equations. Those are the structural perspectives, but we're also going to be talking about the behavioral perspectives. What are the behaviors induced by these, these um, structural descriptions, um, both over time and uh, in terms of their state space uh, ramifications. Their ramifications in these depictions which characterize uh, a, uh, a, a state-based uh, uh, state depiction of the situation, um, uh, how the system can evolve over wide ranges uh, of its uh, state space, and the ways in which uh, that evolution uh, is shaped <clears throat> Uh, within that space, sort of abstracting away from details of time. And so that will lead us to diagrams kind of like this one today, um, the state space depictions, or phase space as they're called, sometimes called. And we'll soon be delving into territory where we need three dimensions and where we no longer have linear systems so we can have different basins of attraction which lead to different regimes for data collection in the, in the systems data uh, sort of emphasis of the course, okay? Um, so we're gonna be talking about interpreting these, and we're gonna go through a set of models, today all linear models, to, to help ground us in what these things really mean and to develop intuitions, okay? And um, we're doing this because linear models are very valuable and you can get some pretty interesting behavior out of linear models. Oscillatory behavior, for example, that, um, uh, to, to the naive observer, it's quite surprising. Um, but it's also because linear models um, are building blocks um, uh, for understanding nonlinear models. Um, and nonlinearity and nonlinear models, in terms of their behavior, um, can be understood to a degree by focusing on them as linear constructs um, at certain short intervals of time or certain critical points, literally, within state space, okay? So um, linear, the, the intuitions we develop with linear systems will end up being very, very useful for interpreting and uh, developing intuitions for elements of nonlinearity. Why not limit ourselves to linear systems? It's because linear systems, um, uh, Number one, they depart markedly from, from the behavior we see in the world for many real world systems. Systems are nonlinear. And while linear systems can be tangled at a certain level, um, they have this property of, um, of uh, that we can decompose them, decompose factors that drive them into pieces and understand how the system affects each of those possible pieces of the input, say different interventions, and by just summing up or taking the average of how they respond to different interventions in isolation with a linear system, we can understand how it would respond to the sum or superposition of those interventions, like having them at the same time. And, and that's not the way the world works, typically. Um, the, the world for many systems is nonlinear in the sense that um, even if we understand a system's response to one thing in isolation or another thing in isolation, it's, just, it's response to both together may be profoundly different. If we use a health example, um, we might think about how someone's uh, body and situation responds to the needs of diabetes. You know, it's supposed they live alone and that they have diabetes and they need to engage in self-care, monitoring their blood sugar, taking insulin, et cetera. 
um, that's a response to their body to this sort of need. And you can argue it's somewhat endogenous, and I don't disagree, but the same principles hold for endogenous causes as exogenous here. And we might think about how a given person responds to dementia in isolation. But if you think about diabetes and dementia together, they're not additive because uh, each affects the other in some pretty profound ways. And, and it's not merely an additive relationship. So we'll be going on to nonlinear systems, but we start by getting our training wheels with linear systems, okay? Um, and when we're talking about linear systems, um, we are going to have to develop a good feel for and intuition for a key way of describing those systems using these constructs we call matrices. Okay? And cognizant of the, of the time required, I'm going to be taking some significant time in this lecture, and if necessary next, to develop intuition for matrices. Because often I find that undergraduate linear algebra courses are, lo are long forgotten by the time students get to the graduate level, like you, yours. Or undergraduate linear algebra courses that taught you about matrices were either taught as or understood as operations on sort of boxes and lines of numbers that you combine according to certain formulaic rules. You, you know, you go through certain rules and add these this way or, or, or you know, combine these this way, multiply two, two long sets into a box or whatever without intuitions. And one of the things I discovered at about your age was, you know, not just how to move beyond banging rocks together to, to you know, um, to, to develop tool sets, but when at your age, I actually, I developed a realization that matrices are extremely fruitful to view as um, geometric quantities, as, as geometric operators, and particularly as linear transformations in, in space, geometrically. Okay. And so we'll be talking about that perspective today and tomorrow. And even if you never do dynamic modeling again, you never want to see ODEs again, you never want to deal with simulation models, matrices are everywhere. If you do computer graphics or you do computer imaging or you, you, know, you want to, to uh, reason about uh, uh, the robot's, a robot's arm or you want to reason, you want to characterize uh, the behavior of a deep learning network, um, Matrices come up everywhere. If you want to do machine learning, it's, it's chock a block full of matrices. You're doing sets of logistic regression, you, you talk about matrices. So matrices are everywhere. And it would, be, it would be a crying shame, in my view, a big lost opportunity, if I don't help you develop some of the same intuitions with matrices that I carry around and apply with student projects and, and so on to guide students. So we're going to be taking a little bit of what someone might unkindly call the detour, but, um, but in fact it will be absolutely essential for us to kind of go through a set of these examples of these four perspectives on dynamical systems in a way that's deeply intuitive and meaningful for you. Okay, so we're gonna use those as examples to develop this intuition for matrices, and particularly starting with linear systems where if you understand the matrix operation in state space, you're golden to understand the behavior of the system uh, more broadly as depicted in the state space characterization, okay? And, and you, it's the clue for understanding the, the system behavior over time as well. Okay, so um, this is where we're going. Let's, let's go and uh, dive in to um, uh, a, just a, a quick reminder of something we talked about last time. And, and this is gonna be a bit of a, uh, of just a notation that's gonna follow us for this module of the course. And we'll probably come back to it throughout the balance of the course, okay? Um, so we're going to characterize an underlying um, set of state equations, a, a characterization of the evolution of our system that for simplicity we'll assume here is characterized by a set of uh, state variables um, that for this lecture we'll assume that they are continuous, 
real numbers, okay? So it's uh, x, y, y, z, okay? And last time I depict this, depicted this using this, this um, s as kind of the state variable, because I want you to remember it's a state. It's a set of state variables, and, and I used um, uh, x through z as particular coordinates within the coordinate system we happen to choose for the vectors, right? So we have sort of an x coordinate, a y coordinate, a z coordinate, but maybe we have many more. Maybe there's a, b, c, d, e, f, g, um, right? Um, as maybe there's, there's many more here. So we have a, a system at any one time, its state is completely characterized by, um, by a, a, a set of states, and in fact, we're gonna be, it's a sequence of states here, it's ordered, right? Um, not in any, it's, it's sort of an arbitrary ordering, whether we put x before z or z before x in the coordinate system, but we're gonna choose one where x is the first coordinate all the way down to, to z, keeping in mind there may be many, hence the dot, dot, dot. And last time I said that we can characterize the evolution of the system with state equations like this. So ds dt, which we can also write as s dot, um, is, is the rate of change of the state vector x, s rather, with respect to each of its components, right? Um, so if we say, we, I'm writing S with a little arrow over it just to drill in the fact that this is a vector quantity, okay? M meaning it's not just one scalar, like one number. It's a, it's a, it's a sequence of numbers. It's a structure or vector of, of numbers, okay? And that's going to have a geometrical interpretation. It's going to be key. And if we talk about DSTT, we're talking about the vector of the derivatives of each of its components. So a vector of dx dt, the derivative of the first component, that are, and all the way down to dz dt, right? Down here? Yeah. Um, and we could write that equally so as s dot or this vector with x dot, y, et cetera, et cetera, dot. Now, yesterday I made a historical aside about, about Leibniz and Newton. Um, and uh, I noted to you that Newton preferred the dx dt type notation, Leibniz, the x dot. I, and I stand remiss for not emphasizing that when we write x dot, I have never in my professional life seen something written as x dot except if it's derivative over time. By contrast, it's very common to see something like df dx, where x is a spatial quantity, df dz, where it's a spatial axis, etc. So wherever I've seen x dot, it always means with respect to time. And that's important um, to understand. And that's why we use it a lot with dynamical systems, systems that change over time, because it's, it's a time-specific measure, okay? And so you don't even have to write dt, because it's just known, hence the dot, right? Okay, so this was our depiction last time. And, and what it's saying is, you know, the, the rate of change of the system is characterized, of the state of the system is characterized by s is given at any one time by some, and I should put an arrow over this f, I stand remiss for not doing that, um, because this is a vector based, a vector valued function, right? If we, it, what we get out of f is a vector, the same, same length as, as s, right? But it takes as an argument s. What does that mean? If, if, if it's f of s, and S is the, the current state, what is that telling you? The rate of change, which is uh, on the left, is given by F applied to the what? C current state, it's the current state. So in general, it's behavior will be radically different, for example, with different current states, right? Again, if there's zero people in the hospital, the, the discharge rate for new people is gonna be zero, of, of, of coming out of that hospital is gonna be zero about this time. You know, if we consider a hospital as zero people and we ask in a five minute segment, you know, at that time, uh, right around that time, how many people are being discharged, the rate is, is zero. If there's, you know, 7,000 people in there after an emergency, you know, a, a, a disaster, there's going to be a much higher rate of discharge, likely. So in general, the rate of discharge, the rate of change of the stock, how many people are in the hospital will depend on the current state, how many people are in the hospital. Yes, Levy. 
I was just thinking something when you see X yes. like that. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Then F will be a linear transform of, of S. Now, actually, uh, I, I'm glossing over something we'll come back to next uh, later, maybe later in this lecture, maybe next time. Because F often includes, you know, I, I really stand remiss here. I should really put a little little arrow over that. So I hope you don't mind if I, if I just do that now because I'm feeling a little bit guilty. Because um, I, I want this to be um, want this to be more understandable. Okay, so yes, that could be a, a, a linear there. But the truth is, there's there's kind of a a special case here where f could also include constant factors. Like imagine you're dealing with um, you know a situation where you have a fixed number of people being admitted for immigration every year or something like that. And there's some, you know, so there's some exogenous flow into the system or you have a bathtub where the rate of inflow is, is given because the, you know, the tap is stuck on. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let you remember, you know, your, your speculation on this go too far. But if this tap is struck, maybe you have, you know, 10 liters a minute coming in, right? So F often will include constants as well, okay? Now, so you'll, you might have like 10 plus something involving S. So it, it's, it's not only dependent on S, it may depend on constants. And it turns out you can have something on the right that depends on constants, like for example, added to, that's a function of S that won't be strictly linear, but we could transform it into something that's linear by a change of variables. And we'll see how to do that. Okay, we'll, we'll see mathematically it's very straightforward with a, a, a system that's inhomogeneously, it's sort of linear with some offset, we just transform it into a linear system. So, so when you say, like, is F purely a linear transformation for linear systems? Well, I'd say, well, the fact is there's some linear systems when we state them naively, technically F is not truly a linear transformation, but when we when we transform their variables, then it becomes linear. And, and we transform it in a linear way, <laughs> okay? So we'll see that, we'll see that. I don't wanna, it, it's not a deep point, but it is a, a practical thing. So last time we said this, right? That's what's on the board right, right there, right? Um, and we had these uh, equations last time, and I talked about some dimensional considerations, which I'll use to build intuition. Okay, um, yes, okay. So. So that was our, our general depiction. And um, I'd like to go into this a little bit, uh, a little bit more. And I want to talk about, about uh, linearization okay, in, this, in this context. Because we're going to be dealing with linear systems. And we actually started with one last time. Okay? Um, we started with one last time. So um, uh, I'll, if I go up here, uh, and maybe you want to follow along. This is a linear system we talked about last time. So it's uh, dx dt equals minus 0.5 x times x of t, right? Um, so this is something where we have a exactly this situation here on the board. Um, x has an outflow equal to lambda x. Oh, sorry, alpha x, where alpha is 0.5, right? Or if I wanted to pick that, and I, I do, I want to depict it visually. We have something like, okay, I was futzing around here. It's example, mm, okay. Um, uh, I, I, I thought I had a nice little example with only that. Um, here, I know a trick. I know a trick. Um, <laughs> right, uh, so. So ladies and gentlemen, here we see what's on, on the board, right? Um, except here I phrased it in terms of mean time. I've argued you could go from mean time to a hazard rate interchangeably with the hazard rate being equal in value to what? One over the mean time or the mean time being one over the, the, the hazard rate. In one time, in, in one case, you have the, the death of x, the formula for that being x divided by mean time. It has to be the case dimensionally, right? because it has to be something that's whatever the units of x are over, over time as, as the dimensions of the outflow. Or you have 
uh, a hazard rate like 0.5 times the value of, of x. Um, and where the, un the dimension of the hazard rate is what? Has to be for it to be, for the, the value of the flow to be alpha times x. The, the dimension of, of alpha has to be what? One over time, one over time, right? Um, so that's this guy here. The dimension of alpha is one over time, right? Okay, so this is a, a depiction on stock and flow terms. And here I would just note that you see this nice little feedback involved. Where's the feedback here, ladies and gentlemen? Where's the feedback? Where's the feedback? Well, the feedback is the bigger x is, the bigger the value of the outflow will be, and as the value of the outflow goes up, x will go will be drawn down compared to the value it otherwise would have had. All those other things being equal, right? And so there's actually a feedback involving the flow here. Now you might argue this is a trivial feedback, but it's not trivial at all if you think about the behavior. If we described it as just a certain number of people dying per day, regardless of x, x would eventually go what? Negative. It would go negative. There'd be nothing to prevent it from going to zero. Here at least, you know, it's, it's, it's limited in terms of its behavior, right? So, so if we go and we, we look at this, um, and we run it, uh, yeah, here we go. You know, we've, it goes down and it, and it, it goes down slower and slower, right? Um, now, now I gotta submit to you, this is a linear system. Now you might object, well, that curve, is that curve? Is that, is that decrease in X over time? Is that linear? Is that a, is that a, a linear construct? Is this going down linearly over time? No, it's not. It's not going down in a straight line. If it went down in a straight line, it would go negative, right? It would, it would go negative and, you know, it would, uh, you'd start getting negative values for x, right? Um, so it's not linear at all in its behavior over time. But what makes it linear is that it linearly depends on the value of what? Of the state. Of the state, okay. Um, it's 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 linearly dependent on the value of of the state here, okay. So so this quantity f is a linear function of s, okay. Now now let's go look at its uh, equation here. It's dx dt equals minus 0.5 times x, and here we have some features that suggest linearity. Well, all we have is a constant times the current value of the state. And it turns out that, well, I won't prove it, there's two fundamental constructs associated with, or two fundamental um, uh, requirements associated with linear systems, okay? Um, and uh, those, those, two, those two requirements are for a function to be linear if that function, if you scale, if you have the function of alpha times x, it's the same as alpha times the function for x. And here we have 0.5 times x, and the question is, okay, um, if we have, you know, if we double x, right? So we double x is, is point, and, and we consider the value of 0.5 times x at the original value of x, and then we double x to, we can call it x prime, right? Call it x prime, so it's x prime equals two times x. And we consider the value of that function 0.5 times x prime. Is that twice what it is if it's 0.5 times x? So, so if we have, I'm sorry, I'm not making this clear, but if we have, um, let's say, we'll consider f of of x where x equals, let's say, one, right? Mm -hmm. And we consider f of x. And f of x here is just alpha times x. It's too bad it's the same alpha here, okay? Um, this is from the model, right? This is 0.5. It's actually minus 0.5 for our, for our state equation um, times x, right? If we have x equal one, what is f of x? What's the value of f of x? 
Just plug it in there, right? I know it might not be all true, but um, this is an x. Okay? Okay? So if x equals 1, what's the value of that? Minus 0.5, right? Pi is f of x equals minus 0.5, right? If x equals 2, so if we double x, that's that alpha there. If we double x, what's the value of f of x? Yeah, minus 1, right? f of x, so, so I'll say x, okay, fine. For x equals 2, f of x equals uh, minus, uh, minus 1, right? And so the question is, we doubled x, does, is the result double? Is the result doubled? Yeah, it's doubled. Yeah. Um, so if we double the input, we get double the output. If we multiply the input by 10, we get 10 times, 10 times the output, right? If we multiply the input by a million, we get a million times, right? No matter, you could multiply x by a billion and, and get out something that's a billion times larger than it was for the original x, right? Okay, so that's a characteristic of a linear sim. But there's also this other criteria, which is f of a plus b equals f of a plus f of b, okay? And, um, and, and this, again, gets to this heart of this issue about the pieces, okay? That if we have a linear system and we consider how it responds to an input that's the sum of something, to understand its response to an input that's the sum of a bunch of things, all we have to do is consider the corresponding sum of how it responds to each of those things, right? This is all about the pieces. Linear systems are all about understanding the pieces. Understanding how it responds to each of the pieces tells us everything about how it responds to the whole thing. And that's going to be violated for nonlinear systems. But for a linear system, this is the case. And I would argue that that is the case for, for this. Okay, and you could do the appropriate arithmetic on it. You can imagine x is y plus z, and substitute it in here. And what you'd find is that you know f of f of y plus so if x is y plus z, then f of y plus z. Well, we just plug it in, right? It's minus 0.5 times y plus z, which equals what? f of y plus f of z, right? We learned this in grade school, right? Things distribute. Like if we have 0.5 times x plus z, it's the same as, as 0.5 times y plus 0.5 times z, right? So, so this is true. This is a linear, this is a linear function of state, okay, um, that we're dealing with here. And this is going to make all the difference. And we're going to see that it's nothing about the behavior being linear in its behavior, that it has to be, you know, straight lines or something like that. It's all about it, how does it depend on the value of the state, right? And, and with a with a nonlinear system, we're not going to be able to, to to understand it how it behaves in response to some some um, combination of things by taking it's it's, it's uh, understanding how it behaves with respect to each of those things, and also it's it's not going to depend in some sort of linear way where you can multiply the state times ten and get something which is. Um, which is just 10 times what it is for, for, for that original state, okay? So, so we're gonna be dealing here with linear systems, okay? Yeah, the lavi. So when you say that, how does it depend on the value of the state? Yeah. So the, the it in there is the, the outflow, is that what it says? Um, yeah, so, so um, let's go back to our to our um, thing on, on the state equations here. Um, so uh, here, and I'm, I'm just gonna put this in because I think it'll be useful when you are thinking about linearity, but um, 
So here, I think you're talking about. Um, so when we say that f depends on s linearly, right? And with this being a particular example, okay? Um, uh, let's 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 try it out, just because people are some whoa, okay. Um, okay, this is like a site for sore eyes. Um, dx dt equals minus 0.5 times x of t, right? So what's on the left here is the rate of change of x, right? That's exactly what this means, ds dt, right? It's the rate of change of, of here each component of s. That includes, yeah, yeah? Um, and in a system dynamics diagram, this corresponds to, for x, the sum of the net sum of the flows into and out of x, right? So the, the rate of change of x is just the sum of all the inflows into x minus the sum of all the outflows into x as a quantity, right? Um, you, you just add the inflows and you subtract the outflows and you get the rate of change of x, right? And so that, the flow, what it's telling you here is, what this is telling you is that the sum of the flows for, for s, and, and in fact, almost always it's the flows for x, each and every one of them, depends only linearly on the current value of the state. Now, I want to highlight the fact here that this is f of s, right? It depends in general on the whole state here, right? Um, it, it, in our case, there's only one element of state, right? It's kind of the, the simplest case, right? But soon, ladies and gentlemen, we will move to two elements. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, um, right? Okay, so, um, uh, okay. So does that answer your question? Okay, let's, let's, let's um, it, we're engaged in PowerPoint weirdness. Did you ever see that book, The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint? Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually really interesting. It argues that that PowerPoint presentations lead to sort of a Stalinist um, kind of, con uh, you know, uh, group think um, where you walk through in a very rigid way a set of materials. And the, the front of the book, I think, shows some Soviet mass march with, you know, perfectly square columns of soldiers and stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you can go look it up on Amazon. Um, if you get it, let, let me see it. I, I want to I know, I think it's serious, actually. And, and I think the, 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 the creators of this book believe, I think actually it may be Edward Tufte. It is. Yeah. Um, and he, who's, uh, I don't know if you know, but he's incredibly famous in the visualization community for creating this beautiful series of books, including what the visual presentation of quantitative information. He's, he's famous for these incredibly creative ways of sort of visualizing information, but also using design elements um, to communicate um, ideas and, and, and concepts and, and quantitative uh, information. And I think it's his book, and I think he's serious that, that you know, an overly structured depiction can lead to um, a stifling of creativity in how we think about issues and so on. And uh, it's a, I think it's a thoughtful piece of work. But it, There's a subheading in the book, Bullet Outlines Dilute Thought. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I've got a bunch of bullets for us to master here. <laughs> um, but believe me, they're not bullets in the Stalinist sense. Um, uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, it was Lenin who said all, pow all political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Horrible, horrible stuff. Um, um, okay, so I want to talk now about these systems um, uh, in general that will help us understand um, uh, why this linearization, what, uh, uh, help us understand linear systems, but also note that many systems, and in general for smooth, continuous systems, we can characterize them in a linear way. So consider that we have a state vector given by x dot 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 z, which in general is going to be an element. This whole vector will be some element of real, you know, n dimensions of real. So it'll be, you know, it's this vector you could think of 
as being some point in n dimensional space where each of the dimensions of that point are uh, each of the dimensions are given by real numbers, right? So maybe n is 3 here. We've got a three dimensional space. Our vectors are of like 3. They have three numbers in them, right? A value at x, a value at y, and a value at z. And those correspond to the value for this point along you know, this axis, you know, the x axis, um, the value of the point along the y axis, and the value of the point along the z axis, right? Here we go. Um, so this is the z axis, right? Um, so uh, hopefully you can read those despite my um, crude writing, but I'll try to prove it. There we go. Okay? So the idea here is so we have some vectors of length n, where the, each of the vec elements of the vectors are, are reals. And um, I argued in those other slides that we could think of this, of a, of a differential equation here. An ordinary differential equation is stating that ds dt as a vector uh, is equal to some vector-based function of the current state uh, s. And I, I prefer to write as s dot, OK? Um, now, it's important to realize, this is actually really important to Grok, that when I write this, um, you could think of this, because f is a vector-based function, and I'm, I'm just going to go back and, and grab this to, to clarify, to sort of really, really make sure this sinks in. Um, this is a vector-based function here, right, of, of the state s, right? So meaning it, it, retur it takes in a vector s and returns a vector. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, are those vectors... Uh, both of length n, or could they be of different lengths uh, for for this case? So, so we have some we have some s as an input vector, and we're getting ds dt out as a vector based function. So, is the vector that's returned by f uh, the same dimension as the vector taken in by s? It is. Yeah. So, so f f hat or f arrow is also a real you know, a real, real uh, n-dimensional real quantity. It's a vector of length n in the re of reals. Okay, and that is equal to, and I'm going to write it this way because this will come up again. There's some particular function that applies for the x quantity. So if we, if we think about this, this is a vector, right? That's why it's a vector function, right? It's a vector-based function, returns a vector. What does that vector look like? Well, it's a vector. And so it has components, right? And there's a component corresponding to the x. And there's a vector cor a component corresponding to the z. It's of the same length, right? It's, it's just one for one of these elements for each of the elements in the original vector s, right? And we could write, without any loss of generality, we could write for the first row, this, whatever the value of x is, um, of, of f, of the, whatever the, the the value of f of s is for the first component x, we could write as f sub x as a function of s, okay? So, so all this is is, look, f of s returns some vector, and we're asking um, what is the function of s that determines the value of the x component of this vector? What is the function of s that determines the z component of this vector, right? Um, uh, this is sounding kind of abstract, but let's let's look at a little example here. Oh, look, we have a model that has two two components now. Okay, all right, x and y. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's in the spread. It's in the, the maple sheet here. If we if we scroll down, mm -hmm. um, uh, here's here's that system. Mm -hmm. Um. Dx dt equals minus x of t. Really, you should criticize me. Um, because what have I left, what have I not shown here? This is, it's actually one times it. Okay, it's, it's one times it. From a software engineering standpoint, I, you know, I've, I've sort of omitted a key sort of tacit assumption. And, and I should be criticized roundly for it. Oh, of course, I can't put it there. It's, it's got to go up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so there's minus one 
times that, and dy dt equals minus 0.5 times y of t. So what's the, what's the hazard rate, the chance per unit time of leaving x? It's 1. What's the mean time in the stock x? 1 over 1 or 1. What's the hazard rate for leaving y? Again, we've got something like this. There's some hazard rate that applies. What is that hazard rate according to that maple sheet, that alpha that applies? It's 0 0.5. What's the mean time in y? 2. 1 over 0 0.5, right? Yeah. OK, so this is a function which we could write. In fact, this is writing it kind of as a vector-based quantity, but let's write it on the board, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, OK. Um, I hate to erase this, but, but I hate to give a crook to your necks. So I'm just going to, um, to uh, put this up here. Um, um, OK. So, so here, let's write out this in the form that I've claimed applies, right? Or, or just, just I'm trying to walk through this slowly. So we have ds dt here, right? For, so we're going to write this as a function, a vector-based function of x, right? There we go, right? Um, and I'm going to go back to the maple sheet so we can see how it applies there, right? OK, so this is what I claim applies. Let's help me unpack this. What is S here? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we delve into deeper stuff. What is S? Yeah, it's a vector uh, where its two components are what? X and Y, right? Okay, now I'm kind of leaving out that X of T, Y of T. And, you know, maybe I should, should do that just to just to kind of make it very clear, x of t and y of t, uh, okay, you like it that way better? Okay, um, so something like that, right? Okay, um, okay, so that's s, and so with, with this equation, what do we have on the left-hand side if we want to write ds dt? Um, well, what we have is, what should I put here? Yeah, dx of t and dy dt, right? Huh? It's the derivative of x, the rate of change of x. Oh, man, I butchered it. Um, okay, there we go. Sometimes I think I should be, you know, the remains of my blackboard should be like in a buffalo jump. Find the remains of butchering operations. Um, okay. Um, I wouldn't go over as well as I thought I could. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, so that's our left-hand side, right? What's on the right-hand side? What's on the right-hand side? What's f of s? It's a vector-based function, so it's some vector with one component for x and one component for y, right? I mean, it's, it's got to be the same, same side vector as this guy. Otherwise, you know, the universe will crash. Um, well, you know, it would be incompatible, right? It's, it's, it, mathematically, it's got to be the same as that. So it has to be the same length, right? Um, there used to be a joke. Right? So, so when I was young, your age, the dominant programming language was C. Um, Charles Simone, the chief architect of Microsoft, was on record saying C now and C forever. Um, it's like, you know, C is the language, the true language, and that's the language which we could hear. That was about a decade before he went out and founded a company to promote a new language. Um, <laughs> I flew in his helicopter one time. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> he's weird. <laughs> uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, there was a joke at that time that the Roman Empire crashed because of null pointers. Um, 
but <laughs> it fell because of no point. Anyway, um, okay, so what is f of s? Could, could we give the components of f of s here? What's, so, so look, this is a vector on the right-hand side. It's the same length here. So there's some, there's some element of this vector that gives the value of dx dt. What is it based on this equation? Yeah, it's minus, for x, it's minus, and we'll say, 1 times x, right? Well, we won't make my sloppy, we won't duplicate my sloppy mistake. It's 1 times x, right? Just to be very clear, there's a 1 there, right? Someone can look at that and not see the assumption, but there's a 1 there. And by the way, that 1 would have a dimension associated with it. What dimension is associated with that 1? It's got to be dimension what? 1 over time for this, because the left-hand side is dimension 1 over time, as dimension of s over time, or dimension of x over time, right? And so the right-hand side has to have dimension of x over time. And so the 1 times x has to have a dimension of what? 1 over time. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, there is something there of significance dimensionally, and we should put it in, dignify it by putting it in, okay? Okay. So it's minus, minus 1 times x of t, OK? Um, so that's the first component of this, right? And that's what I'm calling f sub x here uh, of, of s, of s um, here. It's, it's equal to f, f and, and, and just unpacking s, s is x of t, y of t, right? Here we go. I just want to be sure everyone's comfortable with this notation. Is this f of x, f sub x, is that a vector? Should I put an arrow over that? No, it's just this component. It's a number. It's some number that results from applying some function. And here, what is this function, f sub x? It's just taking taking this state and multiplying the value of x times minus 1. That is. So f sub x here is just minus 1 times x of t. Right? That's what f sub x of the state is. It's minus 1 times x of t. And, you know, I could say, okay, it's minus 1 times the first element of s. I could easily phrase it that way. I'm just write here x of t. Okay? So what's the second element? So, th so that's f sub x. And I argued in that slide that each of the state variables has these elements. So that's f sub x of s. What is f sub z of s here? Well, let's go back to our maple sheet. What's f sub z of s? Well, okay, it's it's the last one, so it's let's say this this component. Mm -hmm. We're doing this for each component. So what is it for this guy? What what is the formula as a function of state that determines the derivative of y? You know, dy dt. What is it? Well, it's minus 0.5 times y of t, right? So f sub y here of s which, you know, I could, I could write here. It's just the, the component of f as it determines y, right? f sub y of f, which is this guy. I'm just unpacking this again. This is what s is, right? This is what s is. This is s, you know, um, to, to make it very clear. Um, and here we go. That is equal to what? Tell me. What is f sub y? Minus 0.5, minus 0.5 times y of t, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that, that's what goes here, right? Minus 0.5 times y of t, right? You, do you see that? That's what that, that's what that is. The derivative of terms of y is minus 0.5 times y of t. The derivative in terms of x is minus 1 times x of t. Now, you might wonder, well, okay, well, why didn't I just, why is this f sub x of, of, of s? Why isn't it f sub x of x? Well, because in general, 
what determines the value of the rate of change of x could depend on other things, right? If we consider our hairs, um, it's snowshoe hairs, multiplying them in Saskatchewan's north. Um, we, and with Hudson Bay Company trapping them, the, the, the rate of change of snowshoe hairs depends on hairs, but it also depends on what? How many hairs are around, so they, they multiply, right? But what else does it depend on? The number of links around, they're predators. So in general, this F sub X, the component of F for determining the rate of change of a given element of S, a given element of it, like X or Y, is, depends on the full state of the system. Here it depends on lengths, and it depends on the number of pairs, as well as the number of lengths. So just here, they were decoupled, because this is a trivial thing. We will soon see cases where they're not decoupled. And almost any system that we're interested in studying is a coupled system where one state, the rate of change of one state variable depends on the rate of change of others, right? Um, what goes on, I've argued in front of you, what goes on in the emergency room depends not just you know, the current state of the emergency room, it depends if there's a flu out outbreak occurring outside. It depends on how many people are in the wards of the hospital in terms of whether we can discharge to that, right? Yeah? So when you go from the coupling system to coupling system, it does not mean that you will change the linear behavior of the flow based on the state, right? Well, we could still formulate it um, we could still linearize it around the current point. My point here is that if we consider in a linear system or a nonlinear how the rate of ch how the system will change with respect to each component of that, mm -hmm. for a linear or nonlinear system, the rate of change of one component could depend on the current state for many components. And we will see a linear system in just a minute where the rate of change of x depends not only on x, but on y. It's a perfectly linear system. It just depends on it linearly. Okay? Just here, they happen to be independent. But that's why that I have f sub x of all of s. It's not just f sub x of x. It's not like the rate of change of x doesn't depend on y at all. It, it, it could depend on any components of this. Sometimes it might not even depend on x. It might depend on the other things. Okay? Um, although in general, it depends on x if it's a it's a physically conserved quantity or you know, a, a material quantity where it can't go negative, okay? Okay, so does that make sense to people, this notation? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean heavily on it in just a moment. Okay, okay so now consider a point in start space. So I went through, I originally named it one thing, and then I thought, oh, uh, I really wanna use that for fixed points. And so I went back and I changed it. I thought, what? Okay, I'm trying to deal with an arbitrary point in state space, a particular arbitrary point. What should I call it? And I thought of mathematicians of all these different ways, you know, S dagger, you know, S star, S hat, S underbar. And a lot of them have connotations and they're useful for other things, like a hat is used to indicate an estimate. I, and then I thought, well, how about a question mark? It's just an arbitrary point. It's a specific arbitrary point, a specific arbitrary point. So consider a specific arbitrary point in our state space. So at some point in this, in this state space, whoa. Oh. Okay, um, well this, this could be really exciting um, for the rest of the semester. Okay, so here we go. Um, maybe I should throw these pens into the audience. Whoever catches it has to answer the question. Okay, then no one's gonna catch it. Um, <laughs> Maybe if someone doesn't catch it, well, no, but then everyone Whatever has to it catch lamps. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Christmas closest to you. Okay, okay. Well, anyway, we, then you can come up with some words. Um, and I, can, I can enact them in a simulation. Okay, so here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, a point, an arbitrary point in state space, um, S, S, you know, it's a vector, right? an arbitrary point in state space. So we're going to call it S with a cap with a question mark. Okay? Okay? Is that okay? So that's our, that's our point. And now consider the region around it. Okay? Um, mm, mm. Um, 
Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I did something uh, very, very bad. Uh, very. Uh, no, no, that's 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 uh, that's. I forgot a term there. Oh, okay. A, a bad. I, I'm sorry, folks. I was a. Uh, um, mm, yes. No. That's that's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, should have made things clearer. I, I mean, I'll have to go modify these slightly. Okay. So. So suppose we consider the area right around that um, um, that area in state space, okay? Um, um, we're going to have here a, uh, what is the value, right? What's the value of um, at, at S? Well, approximately, and this is where I, I got, got in trouble here. Um, uh, the value at S, Value at S is given by, by this, okay? So it, consider we, we know the value at a given, a given point, this arbitrary point we choose. And now we consider a value S of, of S around there, okay, in that, in that region. Um, but even in general, if it's further away, in general, the value at S is equal to the value at this certain point. So now we've got a, another point S. Of S like this, okay, um, and suppose we're, we we know something about the value at S with a with a, um, a superscript um, a question mark. So we know suppose we know the value of S, uh, uh, the rate of change of this uh, there, okay. Um, and uh, we're interested in determining it at some other point S, which is, let's say, nearby, okay? Um, well, look, um, if we want to find the rate of change there, all we have to really do is find the rate of change um, at S uh, with, a, with a question mark, and then consider that you know, we consider the difference in distance between them, and, and we have a bunch of terms reflecting this. So essentially, we have, um, as if S is further, let's suppose S is further from, is, uh, is away from S uh, with a capital question mark, only in the X direction, okay? Then all that's going to determine um, how this value at S Differs from that at s question mark is going to be the value of f at that at certain point question mark plus some term times the difference in x. So we're only differing in x, and so we only are going to have to worry about terms that specify how each of the elements of s differ with respect to um, uh, to the difference in the uh, the x coordinate. And so this construct here uh, is going to be basically our linearization. It's kind of like, I'm going to use the analogy here. It's kind of like, let's suppose we have a line here, okay? Um, so we have a line, um, and we know the value of this line at this certain point S question mark. So this is our S question mark, okay? Um, and we want to know the value of the line at this other point you know, uh, f sub s, where this point here is is s in general. This point here, I'll, I'll write it out as s question. Right? Let's see. Value it there. So I, I wrote a pointer here, but it's actually the value not that. And the value at this point is f of s question. So this is the value here, and this is the value there. How would we get that? Well. You know, we what we would do is we'd consider what is the value at f of s question mark, right? And what could we do if we know s and we know s question mark? Um, what could we consider here? Well, we know the value at f question mark, but we know the value at at s is not going to be exactly equal to that. But how could we figure out what the value at s would be? Hmm? So some function. Let's suppose it's a line. How could we figure out what it is? Hmm? Hmm? How, would you, how, 
do you figure out what the value is? Suppose S is a nearby point here. We know the value of this function at S question mark. And we want to figure out what the value is at, at S, which is a nearby point. So we want f of S, and we want to, we want to compute it based on f of S question mark plus some terms. How, what, would, what would a term be that would actually be good enough for a line here? The slope, the slope of the line, right? Um, We'll, we'll take the slope of the line. We want to find out f sub s here. f sub s um, is, is this guy here. f sub s prime is this is kind of the, the x coordinate of that line at s, s, uh, at s. And then we have, uh, this is s question mark. Yeah. OK, right? And we want to find out what this is. Well, what we can basically do is we could say, well, look f of s minus f of s question mark is, is equal to the slope of the line times what? Yeah, slope, I'll write slope times what? s minus s question mark, right? Right? Okay, so that's, that's great, but what's the slope of the line? It's the d d d d d derivative, right, of f with respect to this axis, right? Um, so I need to pick an axis name here, right? I'll say uh, ds, okay? Recognizing it's kind of with respect to the axis, yeah? Um, so. So really, I should maybe I'll do it a capital S, okay? So there we are. It's a capitalized S. Um, but it's it's this slope in general. You'll you'll want to specify it's that slope at a certain point, okay? And I'll put it here. Now the slope here is all the same, so we don't even have to specify this, right? So if this line goes up um, two to one, you know, rise over run, right? <laughs> goes up for every unit it goes over here it goes up by two then f of s minus s question mark um, if we want to compute that difference uh, based on some difference in s maybe s minus s uh, question mark is one then what would be the difference in s f of s minus uh, the difference between f of s and s minus uh, and f of s question mark it would be what it would be Two. And so, so if if uh, another way to put this is if so if s minus s ha question mark is one and the slope is two, the difference between these guys would be two, right? So in general, we could alternatively write this as delta f of s, right? Equals right um, uh, df ds over the derivative with respect to that axis um, uh, as evaluated at s question mark times delta what? Delta s. s. Yeah. So it's the difference you know, from from the value at s question mark. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, having done that, of course, I can just change change uh, sides here, right? Um, so. So this guy here, I'm just explaining where this equation came from, um, f of s here, right? Mm -hmm. f of s equals, if I take this equation, can I get an equation for f of s in terms of f of s question mark in this guy? So if the difference between these two is given by this formula, f of s minus f of s question mark equals df ds, you know, at point s question mark, times the quantity. This is a number, uh, this is a, a number here, because we're dealing with single dimension, right? S minus S question mark. If that's my formula and I want to compute F of S, what can I do? Just just move it, this guy over, right? It's F of S question mark plus DF DS, right? DF DS, oh, that's a, that looks like a dollar sign. Oh man. 
That'd be trouble. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, add s question mark times s minus s question mark, right? Which is what we have here, right? Uh, uh, um, and by the way, what is this s dot at s? That's equal to what? Sorry? It's equal to, just to, to make this clear, it's equal to this guy here. Um, uh, at, um, maybe that will do. Um, okay, let's just see one more. Hey, there we go. Okay, happy, happy. There we go. Um, so, so just to make that, to make that clear. Okay, um, uh, equals this, that's the same thing. And then there's some higher order terms in general. So this, this is called the Jacobian, okay? And we, we give it the name J. Um, and I want you to understand where this is coming from. I want you to have an intuition for this, for what's going on. And it's gonna be one of a set of matrix intuitions that we're gonna be building up, okay? Um, the basic deal here is that S minus uh, S, S question mark is going to be a vector, right? It's a vector. It's going to have an element for x corresponding with, with x and for y and for z, etc., for each of its elements, right? And what is this Jacobian doing? Well, it's doing the same thing that we're doing here on the board where we have df ds times s minus x question mark. It's just doing it for each of these coordinates in turn and adding up the results, okay? Um, so here we're going to have, I don't know if you remember, when you, this is a column vector, right? This is a, this is a column vector. Um, I'll expand the slide to see this, but if we have this matrix here, df, d f sub x of, here, D, um, so this is partial, the partial derivative, right? Da, 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 da. And um, I'll just write it out for our case, okay? Just to make it very concrete. Can we do this over, I like it better over here. Um, let's, let's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, here we go. So for our case, well, what we're going to have is, is what? We're going to have uh, here, partial f sub x, partial x, right? This is in our Jacobian matrix, and it's going to be partial f sub y, oh, excuse me, f sub x, what am I doing? Partial y. All of these things in the top row are with respect to what? x. It's, it's determining how fast f of x is changing f. X is, uh, the, the x component of this guy here is changing with respect to x, with respect to z, with respect to y, any other things. Does that make sense? And, and we'll see why this is. It's just like how fast, that's what this is, ladies and gentlemen. Can I draw your attention? That, that's what this is. This is how fast f is changing with respect to s, right? So this is, I'll just write it this way, f with a, that, that, that's the same, it's the partial thing. It's just there's only one of them. There's not multiple components, there's only one variable here. So we're figuring out how fast F changes per unit change in S. Hmm? Okay, so, so this is our Jacobian matrix. F, what, what, what do I put here? Y, and what do I put in the denominator? X, X. Yeah. yeah, okay. By the way, these are not twos, these are partial signs. I don't want anyone to get confused, right? Um, uh, and what do I what do I put? Okay, partial f sub what? Y, because we're we're determining it for the yth component of this s uh, over here, this s dot. It, it's with respect to the y the y th <laughs> you know the y <laughs> component of that vector and what is this partial partial y okay notice it the 
Each row is for a particular element of the vector. Each column is for successive elements of that vector. Why? Well, okay, no pun intended. Um, but then we're multiplying by a vector of s minus s. So I'll, I'll write it as delta x and delta y, right? Huh? Right? Now, do you remember matrix multiplication? Yes. So, so this is a, a column vector. This is a, a matrix, a square matrix. They're of compatible dimension, right? We have a number of columns of the matrix equal to the number of rows of this vector. And so this is going to give us what? Does it give us a number? Does it give us a matrix? What does it give us? Applying this matrix to this vector gives us what? What's that? Matrix. It's a vector. Look, a, a matrix is a linear transformation. It takes input. This is the input vector. Mm -hmm. And it gives output, right? Mm -hmm. And the output is going to be of size equal to the number of rows of the matrix, right? And these, the vector that it's applied to which it's applied, its input, has to have the same number of columns as, as in the matrix. So we're operating on this vector with this matrix, and we get out a result. I'm mean, really building this next time. This is the first part of this matrix intuition thing. So what is going to be in the first element of this matrix as a, uh, as a um, uh, sort of as a formula? Can anyone give it to me? The first, this is an equal sign. Um, equal. There we go. Okay, so wh what's the first element here? Let's, let's write it out. Yeah, partial f of x, partial x, right? Times delta x. It's just the dot product of these two. It's this guy times this guy plus this guy times this guy. Okay? Um, and I want you to understand what's going on there. Um, Look, look, it's, what is, what is this guy here? It's, it's partial y times delta y, right? Okay, this is times delta y, okay? Are, are we okay with this? Okay, so what's going on? Look, look, we're, we're, we're displacing ourselves in x and y, and this is telling us a partial f sub x, the partial x, is telling us how fast f changes with respect to a change in x. How fast f of f sub x is changing with respect to a change in x. Partial f sub x with respect to y is telling us how quickly f sub x is changing with respect to a change in y. And so all we're doing is we're figuring out the total change of f sub x, this kind of the the f as computing the, the first part of it um, for, for x um, with respect to the change in x and the change in y, right? So if we only had a change in x, no change in y, all of the change in f sub x, the value of f sub x that results, like here, would come from changing x. If we had only a change in y, the value of delta x would be zero, and all that change would come from partial f sub x, partial y, right? Um, remember this x up here in the numerator, the f sub x, that's just because it's, you know, it's, it's determining this value for something over here on the left where the first thing is, involves x. The second, you know, that, don't get distracted by that x in terms of the derivative or something. It's just, you know, I could have written this as f and this is g. Maybe that would have been easier for people. Then you don't have to worry about f sub x and f sub y. I don't want you to get distracted by those things that's somehow special in the differentiation or something. It's just the point is there's a formula here that determines the value here for the first component. <laughs> that's one times that. And there's a formula that determines the value for the second component here, which is 0.5 times, times y. So, all this is doing is it's figuring out how much this, the value of f sub x goes up when we change x and y by summing up its change with respect to the x uh, with its change with respect to the y. 
That's what that's what this is, right? And it's the same thing with with this guy here. It's it's um, uh, partial x, right? Um, and times delta what? Delta x plus partial f sub what? Y, y with respect to to uh, you know, so this is delta delta. I mean, uh, partial y because we're figuring out how chain, how fast f sub y is changing with respect to y times partial, yeah, delta y, right? So this is just telling us these total derivatives, these things where we're summing up the partial times the change in x plus another partial times the change in y. It's just telling us how fast the corresponding things, like f sub y, change when we change both x and y. Hmm? But that's all we're doing here. Okay, okay, we're just... So this is the first glimpse of understanding matrices here as linear operators here. And specifically, we very commonly have a matrix times a vector where a good way to think about it is each element of the vector tells you, you know, tells you how much you're changing in a certain direction and these elements of the matrix tell you, for example, how, how, how uh, much the result varies uh, as you go in that direction of the first element of the vector. And so this is, you know, here we have these displacements along different dimensions, and the matrix is telling us for the displacement along this dimension, you have to go bring the value of the function up a lot. For the displacement along this dimension, it only goes up slowly. Um, and, and, and this is how we think about it. So here we're taking a dot product of a row and a column in order to understand the result of how much the, the change associated with that row reflects you know, it, as a sum of the changes with respect to each of the displacements with respect to each of the elements of the vector. So it's one way to view matrices, of several I'll be walking you through, is with these dot products. Think about it in a dot product sense. So the dot product here gives us sort of the total change from the change of each of its components as specified by the y. And the, the matrix tells us how much, how quickly it changes in, with respect to a particular displacement direction um, through each of its uh, successive elements in that, in that row, uh, of, of the row there. So this is, this is how the Jacobian is operating here. This is our Jacobian matrix. Um, and, and as a result, we can get out F evaluated at S. F evaluated at S, which gives us the rate of change of S at that point S. So if we're interested in how f, the value of f changes around point, around point um, s question mark, you know, an s near s question mark, um, we can in fact do this in a way that we drop these high order terms. But this is in general, in fact. Um, we're not yet linearizing here. This is a, a general rule. We have the, the value for f of s is the value at s question mark plus this term times this linear displacement plus higher order terms for like a quadratic, but it would be S minus S, you know, question mark squared. It'd be like the distance between them squared, and, and you'd have some rate of change with respect to that. Now, with linearization, we are going to basically, um, uh, basically be able to drop the high order terms, okay? And we're gonna focus for next time, particularly on the case of a, of a fixed point. And that's a point where the only, the, 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 the value of f at that point is equal to zero, okay? Um, so in other words, the right-hand side, the system's in balance. It's static, it's in equilibrium at this point. And that's what we're gonna call S star, okay? And we're gonna consider points uh, around it. But guess what? For all linear systems, this will be the case. For that f of s star equals zero, we're only going to have this linear, 
this linear dependence. Okay? Um, so we're going to use the Jacobians for nonlinear systems through this linearization around a fixed point. But for linear systems, we're actually just going to simply have a case where we have just a matrix times the value of, of s here. And s question mark is going to be 0 for linear systems. Because s question mark is 0, s minus s question mark is what? If, if s question mark is 0, s minus s question mark is s. s. And f of s for a linear system, f of s question mark is going to be what? f of s question mark, if s, s question mark is 0, f of s question mark is going to be f of 0. And for a linear system, ladies and gentlemen, it's very easy to show. Um, and it, it's shown right here. Well, let's, let's just walk through it. And this will be the last point of this lecture. Well, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, here we are. OK, with a linear system, I would argue that if you think about these two things, and particularly the second one, it's going to tell you for a linear system, what is the value of f have to be? Okay? For a linear system, for the, these things to be true, f has to be certain value at zero. And I want you to tell me what it is. So think about this, this argument here. How could you use that to show what the value of f of is at zero? The second of these factoids, f of alpha x equals alpha f of x. Suppose alpha were zero. Suppose alpha is zero. It, for a linear system, it has to be the case that f of zero times x, in other words, f of zero, has to equal alpha times f of x. And what is alpha? Zero. zero. So it has to equal zero. Hmm? So for a linear system, this thing that we were just talking about um, uh, is, we'll choose f of s question mark, I'm mean, sorry, we'll choose s question mark to be zero, goose egg, and, and then f of s question mark is just zero. And in this case, the entire system will will be described by just this first term. There are no, ladies and gentlemen, no higher order terms. Okay, It's just going to be the value of the Jacobian times s minus s question mark. And s question mark is 0. And so it's just times s for, for a linear system, for a purely linear system. All we're going to have is s dot dx dt dy dt, dz dt, that vector of those things is just going to equal some matrix, which is the Jacobian, times the value of the state vector, like s. That's all it's going to be. Okay? We'll come back to this next time, and we will see a bunch of particular friendly examples that we've already started to see, including this first one, which are these linear systems, and we will see how they behave um, uh, in state space as well as over time uh, and we will depict them with the uh, differential equations and the stock and flow models, okay? So this is where we're going but I have put here a general framework which will, will accompany us in a particularly trivial way, in a simple way for linear systems. This is going to equip us to deal with nonlinearity because we're going to have these linear approximations for a nonlinear system where we'll drop the higher order terms and we'll consider around a fixed point. Okay? That's where we're going. Because at fixed points, f of s um, s star is zero. Okay? Okay. That's where we're going. And um, I will look forward to uh, I'm going to get you a little exercise to build a little bit of intuition with this. And we'll go over this uh, with linear systems next time. Um, and we'll also build some more matrix understanding. This was matrices as operators where 
they take the dot product with the vector that comes into contact. Next time we will see matrices where we think about it, the vector that's multiplied by them as successive weights times the columns of the matrix. Okay, And that's what that video I preferred to you um, uh, talks about. It, it really emphasizes that perspective that you know, we're going to think of these as weighting each of these vectors, okay? And that's also a useful, uh, very useful way to think about it in different circumstances. And it's really useful to think about the operation of the Jacobian in state space. So that's going to be a big point of understanding, okay? Thank you very much. That's how you Yeah. Yeah. So, so the higher order terms for a nonlinear system, uh, for, a oh, for a linear system, yeah, I feel it's zero. They'll, they'll all be zero. The higher order terms for a linear system will all be zero. Yeah. Yes, because as it turns out, um, the Jacobian. Um, so I, I argued for for a, a linear system. Um, uh, you know, f of, if we pick s question mark to be zero, um, f of s question mark is zero. And, and then we're just dealing with s minus zero, and so it's s, right? It says matrix times s. Um, you notice that this Jacobian matrix involves partial f sub x, partial x, right? In a linear f, in, a, in an f, each of, in a linear system, F, right? Yeah. If, if it depends only linearly on the state variables, yeah. F sub X is going to either be, well, if, if F sub X is a constant, it's going to be zero. If F sub X is, is some value involving a state variable, you know, uh, either it's going to be, you're going to take like, you know, that's Y and you take partial Y, partial X and it's zero. Or it's going to be like x, and you take partial, you know, it's going to be, say, 3x, or 0.5 times x. You take its partial derivative, you get 0.5, right? Yeah. So it's going to be a constant. And these higher order terms are going to involve second derivatives, yeah. and they'll all be zero. Yeah. So you're going to have a zero matrix yeah. times successive displacements, which, uh, you know, are, are, so those are all going to be zero. Only this remains. This is like the only residual term that you have to worry about. And that's the term that will shape the evolution of the entire system. Because it's linear. The, the first derivative is the last derivative you could take where it's non zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Good question. Good question. Yeah. For a nonlinear system, you'd be taking the second derivative, and you'd be having mm -hmm. a, um, a, you know, essentially a, a displacement here, which would be basically a quadratic type mm -hmm. type factor. Okay, and so if you consider quadratic, like like how much are you varying in x squared? Um, how much are you varying in x times? How much are you varying in y? How much you're varying in x times how much you're varying in z. And with a nonlinear system, if you look in the region right around f uh, s question mark, if you look very close to it, then those terms that involve a square w will go to zero because delta x will be small. Yeah. But delta x squared will be really small. Like maybe delta x is 0.01. Delta x squared is, you know, ten to the minus four, right? Um, uh, or if if delta x is ten to the minus three, delta x squared would be ten to the minus six. Mm -hmm. And so, by choosing, sort of, you know, very local region on s question mark, you're going to be able to, um, to basically make this term, as we say, dominate. This term will, oh, this term, oh man. Is horrible. This term, the second term, 
with the Jacobian is going to be the determining term. Okay, it's going to be it's going to overwhelm the others. The others will be incredibly tiny, and you know if they're not tiny enough, we just can we, we examine even more close. It'll be very much like with this argument here in one dimensions. If instead of instead of having a um, a line, you would instead had you know a um, a curve like this, right? Um, by by considering a very small you know displacement here, maybe this is s question mark here on the left, and this is s here, right? And um, you know, this, this not quite parallel, but um, this is you know f at uh, s question mark here, and this is. And this is f at s here, right? Oh, oh, sorry. Like that, right? Um, um, yeah. Um, there we go. Um, if if we were to consider this, we could still apply this argument. Um, it's just that we'd be considering df ds like at this point s question mark, right? We'd be considering df ds. Um, here, df uh, ds uh, at uh, at s question mark, which will be basically whoa, s question mark, which will be this slope right here, right? And if we're looking in a very thin region around here, this slope is going to be. If we look at like a microscope, this slope is going to be flat for that little little region. And so we can say, you know, if we choose S to be close enough to S question mark, then, then it's the case that, you know, F of S question mark minus, oh, excuse me, ah. F of S minus F of S question mark mm -hmm. is going to be approximately equal to what? To yeah, df ds, you know, to, so the rate of change of f as we change, you know, the value of s along this axis, right? How, how, how fast does f go up? As evaluated at s question mark, why, why do I say evaluated at s question mark? Because if, if we consider the rate of change here as we go up, it's, it's much faster. Mm -hmm. We consider over here, it's very slow. So we're going to evaluate it here, right? In that region, right? And what do I have to multiply this by? Still. So, so f of s, is, is this the case? No. Because if s is super close to f, suppose f of s is equal to s question mark. Is it just equal to the rate of change? No. What is it? Times, yeah, so, so delta s or s minus s question mark. Which, which uh, you know, I like often writing at delta s, right? And this is delta f of s, right? Yeah, um, uh, f of s, right? Um, so, so here it, it's the same basic analogy that if we look close enough, things basically vary linearly. Things basically vary in a straight line, and so we can approximate it in the higher order terms that are present will be really, really small. This, this, this slope here, if you extend it, will be a very good approximation. The higher order terms will be small. And if, if, and if they're not small enough, again, you pick uh, S that's even closer, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and so you're the fine. the higher order is representing the curve. Yeah, it's representing different, uh, so it's rep like the second order will be like the quadratic component of yeah. this. like like. With s squared, you know the, the the next one would be the cubic, you know, so s cubed, yeah. and and if if the displacement again is really small, so these higher higher order terms here, if if, if this were equal, there, you know, if I were saying they're equal, there's there's going to be these higher order terms, and for example, the first of them will be s minus s question mark squared, right, mm -hmm. and if if s is really close to s question mark, so they're only differing by you know, 0.01, mm -hmm. then 
this is going to be really big, and it's going to, you know, and, and uh, it's going to, you know, make whatever it's multiplied by tend to be, the product will be will be small, uh, comparatively smaller. But you know, and you have to be careful because maybe you need a even closer um, closer uh, look. But the Jacobian is basically just this this argument written in multiple dimensions. That's all it is. It's just it's just this argument where you have multiple directions in which you can change s from s prime mm -hmm. or from s s s uh, s question mark. You can change it this direction, that direction, that direction, and where f um, is changing, you know, in each of um, those, the f has a slope in the x direction, f has a slope in the y direction, f has a slope in the z direction. Mm -hmm. So you got to take those into account when you're considering how quickly it, the, uh, the total value of f changes as you go in the x, y, z direction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, it, it, you know, it's a bit of, fancy notation it may look uh, confusing but it's just figuring out how fast does f change given that um, we it's it's changing in the XYZ direction and and we are considering as it changes in, in each of those dimensions um, uh, and we've got to consider all those to you know figure out how f changes when you go to a nearby point that's, that's all it is make sense and it just reduces to that in one dimension. In one dimension. And we are going to, in a nonlinear system, we'll be looking at the we'll be looking at the areas right around, excuse me, the the, the so-called critical points or fixed points where f of s question mark is zero. Where it'll be zero. Because it's in balance at that point. It's not going up, it's not going down, and so the you know, the value of the rate of change is zero at that point itself. And so this will determine it, the whole thing. Um, it will be, well, it, it, in, in points, areas right around that, this will determine how S dot changes right around that. Okay? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at. Is that helpful? Great. Okay. Thanks for the question. These are great. These are so good questions. I'm so proud of my students.